Our three morning thinkers cover the whole range of endeavour. All human life is there. We've got a wonk, a geek, and an autocutie. My thought is going to be about social media, and it, it kind of, it's a good week for me to speak about this because uh, Peter mentioned GMTV. GMTV died last Friday, went out in a huge wake. Uh, which I'm only just recovering from the hangover on. Everyone was there, Anthea Turner, tequila slamming, quite a sight to behold. Um, and we all kind of came up for air round about 10 to 6 on Monday with the launch of Daybreak. So Daybreak, day four, extraordinarily still on air. I still seem to be employed. Uh, but it's also a week when I finally realised that I am an internet entrepreneur, which is extraordinary. I'm somebody that really can't even turn a computer on, or certainly couldn't in January. So it's amazing that everything's come together. I've been looking for something commercial to do for a while, since the beginning of the year. Thinking about things I might do which would have sort of value for me and value for the people that watch me on television. And I met a vaguely sinister looking Russian at a party. He's actually quite nice, but I still prefer the idea that he's vaguely sinister. And together we sort of brainstormed since spring and come up with an idea uh, called goodypass.com. Um, which basically takes celebrities who aren't particularly aware of the internet, some are a little bit more, but are having a presence online. I hate the word celebrities, but you know what I mean. Uh, and allows them to, to talk with their fans, even worse word fans, uh, and also give them something back in the form of discounts and uh, goods and services. I think any public figure, and that doesn't just mean on television or a politician, I think anybody with a company, um, to ignore social media in this day and age is the same as not opening your post, um, chucking it in the bin. And there are people out there already talking about you, already wanting a conversation with you, and you are effectively being as rude as that to ignore them and doing so at your peril. In the United States and increasingly in this country, there are vast numbers of profes hugely professionally successful Mormons. Um, in top-tier investment banks, um, in white shoe law firms, in the Central Intelligence Agency, in the upper echelons of government, quietly this was a religion which had become enormously successful in American public life without anybody really noticing it, that against this backdrop of a weird, kooky set of people who didn't drink alcohol, who didn't drink coffee, who were unusually polite and were sometimes to be found outside train stations and European tourist destinations, harassing you to join their church. There was sort of something magical in the way in which Mormons were brought up, um, in which they learned to become leaders in public life, and in the way they became successful in the upper echelons of American life. And I would sort of set out to find out what it was, and spent almost a year digging around on this topic, and found all sorts of fascinating things. They have a phenomenally interesting mix of professional and religious networking, so that um, the church groups tend to uh, cross over with industry groups as well. Um, equally, the church tends to pick its leaders um, from those who are professionally successful. So there's no clergy, no priests, um, uh, no vicars, just people like yourselves in ordinary corporate jobs who are kind of hoiked out for a while to take leadership positions in the church. And I suppose what I found was there was this peculiarly interesting mix of ecclesiastical and, um, and sort of corporate leadership, in which people who did well in the church did well in business and vice versa. And that made me again reflect on something like Cameron's Big Society, because what you get out of Mormonism is what David Cameron is talking about in an odd sense. I mean, you have strong values of family and self-help. You have civic institutions which are doing what the state does for you, at the moment does for you, supporting you in various ways, providing you with welfare. Um, and I suppose the sort of the, the thought to take away from this is that next week when the Pope is in town, or in general um, when we're trying to talk about um, things like the big society, there is more to learn from um, obscure religious institutions than we might think. 
technology works when the idea of technology disappears. There's a big transition happening now, which I think the best phrase is to call it the natural user interface, which is ways of interacting with machines on a very human level. Last Wednesday, I was in Tel Aviv to see a company called PrimeSense. They developed this little box. It was about that big, about four years ago, and they took it around to the trade fairs. Some people from Microsoft got to see this, and Microsoft, who have a huge business through the Xbox, are trying to expand the market from core gamers to the rest of us, to families, and also to take us from gaming to entertainment. So they started working on this big project, which was known as Project Natal, which came up with a product which is being launched in November called Kinect, which involves a modified version of this sensor next to your TV that monitors you as you move in real time, 30 frames a second, and through very clever algorithms, can track your movements and put you inside the screen. Google Translate, which is an app for the Android phone, you talk into it, it recognizes what you're saying, and it will translate it. So let me try some Chinese. I like fish and chips. Okay. You translate it into Chinese, see if it works. Chinese Stephen Hawking. Our challenge as creative people in the next couple of years is to think, okay, technology, that's a given. How can we use it to make our lives as human beings, as social human beings, more effective? How can we use it in business for what customers want? I want to ask the panel what they make of Eric Schmidt's comment recently of Google. And he's now argued that perhaps he was joking, but who knows? that he could imagine a time when a 25 or 30-year-old would actually get in touch with Google and the other technology companies and say, um, I, if, if it's all right with you, I'd quite like a new identity now, please. You can't erase anything. It's impossible. You can change your name, as Eric Schmidt said, but Experian will link your new name to your old name for credit reference reasons. I wonder, rather than taking David's sort of opt-out approach, whether or not the complaint we ought to have is that um, that no one as yet has invented tools that will allow us to protect our privacy and learn how to do so more actively. If you think that it's going to be easy to control your privacy settings, just have a look at Facebook's privacy policy, which is 5,800 words, longer than the Magna Carta. Who's read The Cult of the Amateur? So, well, it's not widely read here, but it's about that world enabled by new technologies, where people can be visibly imperfect, just like you and me. I think because institutions are being changed by digital communications, trust is becoming an incredibly important currency. Because although you may know lots more people digitally, and you may know about them and they know about you, the one thing that impersonal connection doesn't give you is trust. One of the things we looked at when we were looking at setting up a business was, was the fact that the currency of the celebrity, I know I hate that word, but there is trust in someone you see when you're brushing your teeth in the morning and there's trust in, in listening to what they say about offers and discounts and that brought it back and that I think is where it steers people through the marketplace of, of many sides. You've learnt some fantastic things, some disturbing things. One is, of course, that goodypass.com <laughs> can change your life. Thank you all very much indeed.